you had any morning like I did, I was going from one place to another, and every time I looked up, I said, oh, it's not as late as I thought it was, and then I'd look at something else, and it would say, no, it's later than that, and I realized that all my uh, cloud items were catching up, and then all of my manuals were not. I'm Elizabeth Sackler. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I welcome you. I'm the founder of the Sackler Center here, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of currently being the board uh, chair. And I'd like to know how many of you are coming to States of Denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color for the first time. Would you raise your hand? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We've had two years of wonderful programming. It's all available online to be seen, www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash video. You can see all our previous programs, which are extraordinary. And um, if you're a Twitterer, I'm at Sackler Soapbox, or we have a hashtag, States of Denial BKM for today. Uh, it is really a huge pleasure for me to welcome uh, you. After my introduction to Mr. Stevenson, um, uh, I'll provide right now some uh, background on today's programming, so will he. Uh, we'll watch a short video, and then we'll hear from Mr. Hinton, and then we'll see a se second video, and then Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Hinton will engage in conversation, and time permitting, I hope we will certainly have question, uh, time for questions and answers. Um, for those of you uh, who have read Just Mercy, and can I ask to see a show of hands of people who have? That's marvelous. That's just marvelous. I want, I want to share with, for those of you who haven't, I, uh, I suspect you'll leave here and you'll go right to Amazon or your local bookstore. Um, I want to share with you a personal anecdote uh, that may echo for you, for those of you who have read it. Uh, in 19... Uh, in 20, 19, 1912, in 2012, mass incarceration and the horror of our policing and judicial prison system surfaced fiercely and with force. New Yorker articles, Michelle Alexander's groundbreaking, The New Jim Crow, and the New Press's continuing publications on state-sanctioned violence, and news, finally front page news, finally, that continues now four years later about police violence, our unjust judicial system, and the horror of our systems of incarceration. All systems that are replete with corruption inside and out, and unfortunately continuing. When I read Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, this is what it looks like, I thought as I was reading it, as I opened it, that I couldn't read anything that was going to give me more information or more unbearable information than I had already learned. Um, it was a couple of years ago that I was with this book. It was over the holidays, Hanukkah, Christmas, and New Year's. That's when this book, that's what I was doing. I devoured it, and when I closed it, I cried. I cried through it and I cried after it. Um, it is and describes things that are worse than anyone could possibly know or even imagine, and I am so grateful to Brian Stevenson for having done this work and for writing about it so that we can learn. So uh, as soon as I closed the book, Brian and I, for the year before, had been in touch uh, during that year to try and schedule his appearance here, but he was very busy on a book tour because uh, Just Mercy had just come out, States of Denial was in its second year, and um, he was also busy, of course, with his ongoing work with the Equal Justice Initiative, and there was uh, simply no room in his schedule, which I completely understood. Um, but as I turned the last page of Just Mercy, and as I closed the book, I literally at that moment pulled out my iPhone and uh, called Brian. 
And perhaps he remembers this, but he probably doesn't because he, he's spoken with hundreds, maybe thousands of people and admirers at this point. But I remember because I was having this one particular conversation with Brian Stevenson. And I want to share with you two sentences of that conversation. I said to Brian, Brian, how do you do what you do day in and day out, month after month? year after year. It must be devastating. And he said, it is hard. It is hope that sustains me. That was his reply. Four letters, H-O-P-E, hope. Saving grace, and we all reach for that to make the world right. We look in hope. You must have it. It guides us. It fuels you. And ultimately, I do believe it is our salvation and our redemption. Hope sustains us and hope keeps us fueled, but hope alone, as we know, will not change the world. It has to be supported with tenacity, with clarity of purpose. It has to be supported with knowledge and an impenetrable belief in truth and in justice. Brian Stevenson embodies all those things. He is a gift to the people whose lives he saves. He is a gift to this movement, to this world. And I thank you, Brian, for your badge of hope that keeps righteousness on high. And I thank him also for being here with us today at the Brooklyn Museum. About Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and a professor of law at New York University, uh, New York University School of Law. He has won relief for dozens of condemned prisoners, argued five times before the Supreme Court, and won national acclaim for his work challenging bias against the poor and people of color. He has received numerous awards, including the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. About Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson was a young lawyer when he founded the Equal Justice Initiative in a legal practice dedicated to, to defending those most desperate and in need, the poor, the wrongly condemned, and women and children trapped in the farthest reaches of our criminal justice system. One of his first cases was that of Walter McMillan, a young man who was sentenced to die for notorious murder he insisted he didn't commit. The case drew Brian into a tangle of conspiracy, political machinations, and legal brinkmanship, and transformed his, Brian's, understanding of mercy and justice forever. Just Mercy is at once an unforgettable account of an idealistic, gifted young lawyer's coming of age and an inspiring argument for passion in the pursuit of true justice. New York Times bestseller list, named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Seattle Times, Esquire and Time winner of the Carnegie uh, Medal for Nonfiction, NAACP Image Award, Books for a Better Life Award, Los Angeles Book Prize, Kirkus Reviews Prize, and American Library Association no Notable Book. Ted Conover, in the New York Times Book Review section, wrote, unfairness in the justice system is a major theme of our day. This brings new life to the story by placing it in two affecting contexts. Brian Stevenson's life work and the deep strain of racial injustice in American life. Against tremendous odds, Stevenson has worked to free scores of people from wrongful or excessive punishment. And the message of the book, hammered home by dramatic examples of one man's refusal to sit quietly and countenance horror, is that evil can be overcome and a difference can be made. Stevenson has been angry about the criminal justice system for years, and we are all the better for it. About the Equal Justice Initiative, and there are 
um, uh, there are calendars outside for you to take with you. This is their, uh, the Equal Justice, well, excuse me, in initiative annual report from 2015. The EJI fi fights for the release of innocent people wrongly convicted and condemned to death by execution or sent to prison for life. They have won new trials for people illegally convicted and relief for those unfairly sentenced. They have documented and challenged abusive conditions of confinement in state jails and prisons and have continued to fight against the persecution of children in adult court and obtain new sentences for children who have been condemned to die in prison, some as young as age 13. The EJI is committed to ending mass incarceration, combining litigation and reform advocacy, research, reports, public education, a very dynamic website, and community outreach to end America's status as the world's most punitive nation with the highest rates of incarceration on the planet. And with that, would you please join me in warmly welcoming today Brian Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great, great honor for me to be here. I'm delighted uh, to be back here in Brooklyn. Uh, it's an extraordinary honor for me in, in one other respect as well. As was mentioned uh, by Elizabeth, I've, I've really had the great privilege over the last year uh, to be talking to communities across this country as a result of this book uh, that I wrote. And rarely uh, do I get uh, to go places where two people uh, critical to the creation of this book are in the room with me. And so I, I really can't uh, miss taking this opportunity to thank two extraordinary people uh, who made this book possible. And I'm just deeply uh, indebted to both of them for the way in which they have allowed us to kind of show people this world. I, I don't think I have radical perspectives and views on a lot of these issues. I believe if most people saw uh, what I see on a regular basis, they would want change. They would demand change. I think if most people understood the things that I understand about what we're doing uh, to people in this system of incarceration and excessive punishment, uh, they would want change. And I've been really encouraged by how this book has allowed me to kind of share that perspective with other people. But it wouldn't be possible if I hadn't been really fortunate, uh, just almost, uh, it was a miracle to be connected uh, with uh, who I think is the most talented, thoughtful, and visionary editor in America. And I'm really thrilled that he's here tonight. And I'd like Chris Jackson to please stand so I could acknowledge his wonderful guidance in this project. Chris. He's very modest, but he is changing the way we think and talk about issues of race and justice, and I'm really grateful for that. And another person who is here tonight, uh, this project would not have been possible. I was very reluctant uh, to engage in taking time to write a book, to kind of take time away from my clients and my work, uh, but this persistent and very kind and thoughtful uh, person uh, led me to understand uh, certain things about what was possible, and he's been an incredible friend and guide and uh, manager for me, and it's my incredible literary agent, Mr. Doug Abrams. I'd like him to stand as well. So there are these realities that, that, that we have to know about. We are, are a very different country today than we were 40 years ago. In 1972, there were 300,000 people in jails and prisons. Today, there are 2.3 million. Uh, the United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. And it's not just the people who are imprisoned that have been affected by this era of over-incarceration. We have six million people on probation or parole in America. There are 70 million Americans with criminal arrests, which means that when they try to get a job or try to get a loan, they are disfavored. They are burdened by that arrest history. Uh, the percentage of women going to prison has increased 640%. Uh, in the last 20 years. 70% of these women are single parents with minor children, which means that when they go to jails or prisons, their children are displaced, and you're dramatically more likely to end up in prison if you are the child of an incarcerated parent. 
Uh, there are collateral consequences. This past weekend in Alabama was the anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. Last year was the 50th anniversary. And the president came, and members of Congress came, and 80,000 people came to participate in the 50th anniversary celebration of the Selma to Montgomery March, which led to the Voting Rights Act. And very few people who came to Selma had any idea that today in Alabama, 31% of the black male population has permanently lost the right to vote as a result of a criminal conviction. What we have done to disenfranchise and marginalize people of color is a real crisis, and we've got to do something about that. But then there's this other phenomenon that we haven't addressed. I believe that today in America, we have more innocent people in jails and prisons than we have ever had in our nation's history. Thousands of people innocent. And we cannot understand what a tragedy that is. We cannot understand uh, how uh, challenged we ought to be by that phenomenon until we begin to know the stories of some of these people. And I was eager to come here to do this event today because I am able to do it with an incredible human being. Uh, one of my clients, uh, Mr. Anthony Ray Hinton. Mr. Hinton spent 30 years on Alabama's death row for a crime he did not commit. It was excruciating. It was devastating. He went to death row in 1985 before there were ATMs, before there was an internet, before all of the technology that many of us have been dealing with. And he spent these long years. Uh, he witnessed 50-some people go to execution. Uh, we talked at times. He would talk about smelling the flesh burning on the day after these executions. And yet, he did something extraordinary. He didn't just survive. He became this voice of hope and possibility. And what excites me about today is that this time last year, Mr. Hinton was locked down in a cell. If we had scheduled this last year, I couldn't have done this with him. But today, he is free, and he is here with me. And I can't tell you how moved and honored and, I ex and excited I am about that. Over the last year, I've been giving talks, and I've been talking about how I don't think we can change things until we get proximate, until we change narratives, until we allow our hope to lead us to do uncomfortable things. And what I wanted to do today was to give you an opportunity to get close uh, to this remarkable human being, this survivor, this exoneree, this person who was wrongly condemned, because in his story is the story of our nation and the challenges that we face and the opportunities that we have to do more justice. Uh, I have been representing people uh, on death row for 30 years. Uh, I've been representing people in prison for the same time, and usually when I go to jails and prisons, I'm tolerated. Uh, sometimes I'm challenged by correctional staff who are hostile. Sometimes I'm even uh, blocked and, and threatened and menaced. Uh, and during my time representing people in jails and prisons, uh, that was pretty much the range of my experiences until I started working on Mr. Hinton's case. And I had the great privilege of representing him for 16 years. And something really extraordinary happened. When I would show up to the prison, I'd have guards asking me, when are you going to get Ray Hinton out? I had guards questioning me about how he could be on death row when it was so clear he was innocent. And his witness was so powerful that it actually changed the people around him. That is the strength of his testament. That is the strength of his character. And I'm really deeply, deeply honored uh, to be able to share the stage tonight with him. Uh, we'd like to show you a video just to give you some context for his case, and then I'd like to bring Mr. Hinton to the stage to talk to you about his experience before we carry on the conversation. So with that, uh, let me uh, warmly uh, ask you to, in, uh, to welcome Mr. Hinton, followed by the video, and then Mr. Hinton will join the stage. Thank you very much. For 30 years, Anthony Ray Hinton was a dead man walking. Thank you, Tebo. Thank you, Lord. Prosecution seemed being to take my life from me. 58 years old, Hinton lived more than half his life inside a cage, Holman Correctional Facility in Southern Alabama. Today, he's seeing and experiencing things for the first time in decades. Oh my goodness. So, he is welcomed home, a party in his honor, 
hosted by the Equal Justice Initiative, led by attorney Brian Stevenson and his team of attorneys who fought for decades to win Hinton's freedom. Thank you for giving me my life back. Just being here as a team, you can say that you got an innocent man off there for him. His nightmare began in 1985. Ronald Reagan was president, Back to the Future was a box office hit, and under the cover of darkness, two Birmingham restaurant managers were shot dead at closing time, just months apart. A third victim, another man who survived the shooting and helped identify 29-year-old Anthony Ray Hinton as the killer. You're a free man now. What does that mean to you? I mean everything. I mean, uh, you never think about your freedom until it's taken away from you. You couldn't put a price tag on it. They got my $12 back already. <laughs> so much about the world has changed, but the greatest still is a world without his mother. She died while he was locked away. It can't get no lower for me. I'm not a shame of I'm proud of it. That's the busted love of my life. He goes back to the home they share together, now abandoned. Kind of hate to see it in this shape. It's his first time there since the night it was all taken away. This is the room where Hinton's mother kept her 38 caliber revolver. Police said it was the murder weapon. Hinton's court-appointed public defender hired a supposed ballistics expert to dispute the prosecution's claim about the murder weapon. A persuasive expert, he was not. So his ballistics expert was blind? In one eye, yes, that's correct. He had to ask how to turn on the machine. He couldn't see it. He had to ask somebody please help me. So when he put him on the stand as my witness, they crucified him. I said, they're going to find me guilty. Hinton was sentenced to death. He was ordered to spend the remainder of his life in prison, living inside a five by seven cell. Pretty much sleep in a fetal position because your feet hang over the bed. You only have a bed that is mounted to the wall and a toilet. And that's what I lived in for 30 years. They took my 30s, my 40, my 50. But what they couldn't take was my joy. I couldn't do a thing about the years, but I could control my joy. 53 inmates were executed at Holman while Hinton was on death row. My darkest memory would be seeing so many people that I got to know be executed. He languished in prison for years before his case reached appeals court. I was, had never been so convinced of someone's innocence than I had in Mr. Hinton's case. No one asked them. Judge Sue Bell Cobb was one of those appellate court judges who believed his story. There was no incriminating evidence. He didn't have anything from the robbery. There were no fingerprints. This is extremely unusual. His appeal was denied, but his team kept fighting. Uh, we'd exhausted every state court appeal, and it was the United States Supreme Court that finally intervened. The result was a new trial, the break Hinton had been waiting for. But just a few weeks ago, the state of Alabama dropped the case after a new look at the evidence could not match the bullets to the gun, and Hinton was released. <laughs> Since I've been locked up for 30 years and finances is tight, five dollars a slice. <laughs> I don't sense any bitterness. Why is that? Bitterness kills the soul. I cannot hate because my Bible teach me not to hate. I've seen hate at its worst. What would it profit me to hate? I want you to know there is a God. He said high, but he looks low. He will destroy, but yet he will defend. And he defend me.
three minutes, four minutes film cannot tell you the 30 years of pure hell that I went through. I went through 30 years of pure hell because I was born black and poor. Make no mistake about it. The prosecution knew that I was innocent. But yet, when you have the power to send an innocent man to death row, when you are racist, and that is exactly what they did. 30 years ago, I had made a mistake. Instead of staying outside, I came inside and my mom, she asked me, she said, are you going to revival tonight? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, you got time to go out there and cut the grass. And I looked at my mom and I said, Mama, I'll cut the grass tomorrow. And my mom looked at me and she said, I'm trying my best to see how you got to cut the grass tomorrow. I'll to go cut the grass. And one would have to know my mother, when she tell you to do something, you go out and you do it. <laughs> and so I went on outside and I fired up the lawnmower and I began to cut the grass and about 15 minutes into cutting the grass, I happened to look up and there was two white gentlemen standing at the edge of the porch. I cut the lawnmower off and I asked them, I said, can I help you? And they said, yes, we're looking for Anthony Ray Hinton. I said, that would be me. How can I help you? They identified themselves as a lieutenant and a sergeant of the Bessemer Police Department. Again, I said, well, how can I help you? And they said, well, right now we have a warrant for your arrest. We would like for you to place your hand behind your back. I did as I was told, and I asked them, what am I being arrested for? And they said, we will explain that to you later. So they had every intention of carrying, putting me in the squad car, but I kind of balked. I said, I want to go inside and tell my mother that I'm being arrested for something. And one of the detectives said, we can't let you go inside. And we stood there and we argued for about 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And the other detective said, let him go in and tell his mother he'd been arrested. I go in the house and I show my mom the handcuff. And like any good mother, she began to scream and holler, what are y'all doing with my baby? And I said, baby, literally, because I am the baby of 10, five boys and five girls. One of the detectives said, take him on out, and now I'm going to stay in here and talk to his mother. And I, on my way to jail, they asked me, did I own a pistol? And I said, no. They said, do your mother own a pistol? And I said, yes. My mom taught me to tell the truth. She always taught me to stand up. She said, do not ever throw a rock and hide your hand. If you was man enough to throw that rock, be man enough to say you throw that rock. So I told them the truth that my mom had a pistol and they went back and retrieved the pistol. They had no warrant, but my mom gave them the pistol thinking it would help me. They come and they carried me to jail and on my way to jail, I asked this detective 50 times, what am I being arrested for? And the detective never would answer. And I guess on the 51st, he finally answered, he turned around and he said, you want to know what you've been arrested for? I said, yes, sir. He said, first degree robbery, first degree kidnap, and first degree attempted murder. I said, man, you got the wrong person. He continued to look at me and he said, I don't care whether you did it or not, but you're going to be charged with it. You're going to be found guilty for it. He said, there's five things that are going to find you guilty. Would you like to know what they are? I said, yes, sir. He said, number one, you're black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him whether you shot him or not. Again, I don't care. He said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, 
you're going to have a white judge. And number five, by all account, you more than likely will have an all white jury. And he said, you know what that spell? And he repeated the word conviction, 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 conviction. And so I go to jail and I ask this detective, I said, what time, what date did this crime take place? And he go through his file and he tell me, I said, it couldn't have been me, for I was at work at that time. I gave him my supervisor's name and I gave him the number where he could call and check. And apparently they did something. And he come back probably within two hours and he said, we're not charging you for those three crimes. We now officially charging you with two counts of first degree murder. I didn't even know what capital murder was. He explained it to me. And I went before a judge. The judge asked me, could I afford an attorney? And I told him no. He said, the great state of Alabama will appoint you one. And he called his lawyer up and told this lawyer that he wanted to represent me in two capital murder trials. The lawyer did not ask me my name. He looked at me and he said, I did not go to law school to do pro bono work. And I looked at the lawyer and I said, would it make a difference to you if I told you that I was innocent? The lawyer looked back at me and he said, all of y'all are always saying you didn't do something. And so I lingered in jail for two years and I went to trial and they found me guilty of capital murder and on December 17, 1987, I was sentenced to death row. And for three years, once I got to death row, I did not say a word to anyone. It was as though God had just taken my vocal cord and every time an officer would ask me my name, or ask me anything, I would write it on a piece of paper. And one night, going into the fourth year, an inmate, I heard him crying and I asked him what was wrong and he told me that he had got word that his mother had passed and I told him, look at it, that now he had someone in heaven that was arguing his case before God and I told him a joke and we began to laugh and the next morning, my sense of humor kicked in. I often tell people I was born with two things. I was born with a mother that loved me unconditionally. And I was born with a sense of humor. My sense of humor carried me so far till I began to believe that I was somewhat kind of crazy myself. <laughs> I imagined things while I was there. I imagined having tea with the queen. And I imagined the queen asking me, but you care for a spot of tea. <laughs> and I would tell the queen, well, of course. And she would ask me, what would I like in my tea? And I would tell her, a spot of lemon. <laughs> and so that is how I was able to cope being in a five by seven. I even imagined marrying, and I married two of the most beautiful women that I think God had the privilege of making, and one of them was Halle Berry. <laughs> And the second was Sandra Bullock. <laughs> and so I tell people, they ask me, why did you do that? And I tell them that when you live in a five by seven for 24 hours a day, you have to allow your mind to be free. My body was there, but my mind soared. My mind went everywhere. I went to France and I racked up so many freaking mileage that after uh, this evening, if you know you want to buy any freaking mileage, come see me. <laughs> but as I sit there and begin to wonder how am I going to get my case overturned, how am I going to get my freedom, I never did think about it. For I also was born and was made to believe in God. I was also made to believe in faith and have faith. And so one day, a guard come to my cell and he said, Mr. Hinton, you have an attorney. I said, I don't have an attorney. He said, well, someone out there pretending to be an attorney. 
And I say, okay. He said, well, get up and put on your clothes and go out there and talk to him. And I go out there and he tell me somebody by the name of Mr. Bryant Stevenson had asked him to represent me. He told me his name and he told me he was from Boston. I didn't know Mr. Stevenson. I never heard of Mr. Stevenson. I didn't know anything about EJI. But when he said he was from Boston, I said, I wish Mr. Stevenson had checked with me before he sent you down here, for I am a beloved Yankees fan. <laughs> I, I said, I don't know how a Yankee and a Boston attorney are going to get to work, uh, work together. I said, but for your sake, I'm willing to put my personal feeling aside <laughs> and let you work on my case. And for two years, he worked on my case, and he came to see me on the third year, and he said, Mr. Hinton, I'm trying to get you a life without parole. And I looked at him, and I said, life without parole are for guilt, innocent, are guilty people, not innocent people. I said, so since you feel that I'm guilty, I need someone that believes in me. I said, today, this is where we part. When you go out the front door, don't worry about coming back. I need someone to work on my case that believe in me. And he said, are you sure? I said, I am. And so I goes back toward myself and I'm telling myself, you got to be the dumbest person in the world. You fired the only lawyer that you had. And as I go back, the lawyer the, uh, that I fired, he goes and I go back to myself and one of the guards is watching TV and. Lord and behold, there's Mr. Brian Stevenson on TV. And I asked the guard, I said, who is that? He said, that's Brian Stevenson. He's against the death penalty. He's out of Montgomery. And I said, well, be quiet. Let me hear what the man is talking about. And I listened, and I loved what he was saying. And I knew that I had to write this man, but I didn't know how I was going to write him because most people say, I must be a doctor in another world because you cannot understand my handwriting. But that night, I began to write Mr. Stevenson, and it was as though something took my hand and wrote the perfect letter. I remember saying that Mr. Stevenson, my name, and I was innocent. I remember telling him that I cannot afford to pay him for his time, but I would be more than willing to pay him from his gas to come down and talk to me. I told him in my letter if he could find just one tread of evidence that point to my guilt, don't worry about coming. I would take whatever punishment that the state was giving me. I received a letter from Mr. Stevenson replying that he would read my case and he would get back in touch with me and true to his word, approximately four months later, I got a letter that he had made an appointment with the prison to come see me. And when he came, the moment, the moment I shook his hand, I knew that God had sent me his best. I felt something that to this day I cannot describe. And we sit down and we talked about my case and I looked at Mr. Stevenson and I said, Mr. Stevenson, I need you to do something for me. And he said, what is that? I said, I need you to hire a ballistic expert. Mr. Stevenson looked at me and he said, well, I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> and I said, no, Mr. Stevenson, I'm not explaining myself right. I need you to hire a ballistic expert. But I need, I need this ballistic expert to be white. I need him to be from the South. I need him to believe in the death penalty. I said, but more important, all I ask of him is to tell the truth. And Mr. Stevenson left me that day and he said, I will do my best to try to find that type of person. Four months later, the guard come and said, call your lawyer. And I called Mr. Stevenson and he said, Ray, I hired two experts out of Texas and one of them out of Virginia. 
They testify 98% of the time for the prosecution. They send men to death row. They never help get them off death row. And I asked Mr. Stevenson, I said, did you say two of them from Texas and one of them from Virginia? He said, yes. I said, well, they don't get no Southern than Texas and Virginia. <laughs> I said, when will they be coming to check the bullets? And Mr. Stevenson said, well, I don't know, but they will come. And I said, okay, thank you, and we hung up. Later on, Mr. Stevenson told me what I already knew, that all three of them came at different times and they tested the bullets. And they all came back with the conclusion that the bullets did not match the way the state said they did for the state of Alabama. Took 30 years of my life And while that 30 years was going on, I received the sad news that my mom had passed. I don't think there's a young man in the world that loved his mother more than I did. I wasn't born with money, I wasn't born with a lot of things, but I was born with a mother that I could talk to that loved me. And at that moment, I began to say, well, I don't care what the state do. My mom is gone. I have no reason to live. And I heard a voice say, I did not raise you to be a quitter. I did not raise you to quit. You fight. You prove that you are innocent. And I called Mr. Stevenson, and I said, Mr. Stevenson, I want you to do whatever it takes to win my freedom. And Mr. Stevenson said, okay, Ray, we gonna give it our best. And he came down one day and he said, I am tired of fooling with the judges in Alabama. I wanna send your case to the United States Supreme Court. And Mr. Stevenson told me if I lost it at the United States Supreme Court level, what would happen? And I asked Mr. Stevenson, I said, do you have any change in your pocket? And he said, yes. I said, will you buy me a Coca-Cola at the machine? And he said, yes, would you like some chips? I said, no, just a Coke. At that moment, after listening at the possibility, I prayed. Instead of that being Coke in that can, I hope it was full of whiskey. <laughs> because I didn't feel that no man should make it up a decision off a soft drink, he need a stiff drink. <laughs> but I took a swallow of that Coke and I slammed the can down on the table like they're doing back in the Western days and I told Mr. Stevenson, I said, you are the one that went to Harvard. You do what you feel is necessary. Mr. Stevenson said, good, I'm gonna fight it and I'm gonna send it to the United States Supreme Court. Two years later, the United States Supreme Court did something that they never have done in the history of the court. They ruled nine to zero that I was entitled to a new trial. And I thought I was going home. After finding out what I know, that the bullets didn't match, Mr. Stevenson petitioned three different attorney generals in Alabama and asked them to just retest the bullets. But my life didn't matter to anyone. And I had to sit on death row for an extra 16 years when all they had to do was retest the bullets. But they refused to do so. And so finally, we go to Birmingham and the DA office now played tricks and they accused EJI of not turning the gun over. The gun had been lost. The judge granted them a two week stay. They find the gun and they come back now and they said they can't find the bullets. And I had to stay in jail an extra two months. 
And on April the 3rd, 2015, I walked out a, a free man. But in that being free, every morning I still wake up at 3 a.m. expecting someone to holler breakfast because on death row they feed you every morning at 3 a.m. because it is the law that they have to wake you up and offer it to you whether you eat it or not. I find myself instead of showering every day, I still shower sometime every other day because that's how you shower on death row. I haven't been out a year. I want you to know that 30 years, eight months, nine months, a year will not erase 30 years. That house that you seen that was in bad shape through generous donation, I've been able to fix it. And I have what I think is some of the nicest furniture that you could look at. After sleeping in a fetus position for 30 years, I went out and I bought this king size bed. I didn't just buy any king size bed. I bought a California king size bed. <laughs> the problem with that is I still yet, I still cannot sleep stressed out in that big bed. I still bring my knees up to my chest. I have this beautiful shower. Instead of showering every day, two times, three times a day, I find myself showering every other day. But I want you to know today that I forgive those racist white men that put me in prison. They haven't asked me to forgive them. I forgive them not so they can sleep at night. I forgive them so I can sleep at night. I forgive them so I can enjoy the rest of my life. I forgive them so I can enjoy all of the things that God created. Well, most of you do not pay the sun, the moon, the stars any attention. I go out every night and I look at the moon and I look at the stars because I was denied that privilege for 30 years. Most of you run out of the rain, I run into the rain because rain was not allowed to fall on my body for 30 years. I believe that when you lose something and when it finds its way back to you, you should love it even more. I love life more than I ever have. The things that I used to take for granted, I do not take those things for granted anymore. There's two little birds that wait on me every morning before they begin to talk and I sit there and I watch them. There was a time I would not have paid those birds any attention. But being on death row for 30 years of a cell that is no bigger than your bathroom, it makes you appreciate life. No one in Alabama have yet to apologize to me for the 30 years that they robbed me of. I had the undone pleasure of smelling human being that was literally set on fire by the electric chair. I have to try to make every day the best day that I can. I try to put one foot forward and every day I am determined to make someone smile. I will never treat anyone the way that I was treated because I believe that what this world needs is love. And I believe that if anyone can show anyone any kind of compassion and love, it is I. For I do not hold anyone. I do not hate 
I do not think about those men that literally put me on death row for something that I didn't do. And in closing, I would like for everyone in this room to try. Imagine being in a five by seven. And after you imagine being in a five by seven, imagine being there for 30 years. And after you imagine being there for 30 years, try to imagine being there for something that only you and God know that you didn't do. Thank you. So you really cannot appreciate um, the consequences of what I think our collective indifference have done, has done on this issue of mass incarceration until you start uh, getting to know people like uh, Anthony Ray Hinton. And I've told lots of people that no one has inspired me more, no one has encouraged me more uh, than Mr. Hinton. And, uh, uh, we would be on death row sometimes in the visitation room. And uh, the way the, the appeals process works is that you'll file something and then you'll get a ruling. And we kept filing things and things would go so well at court. We had the hearings where we put on these experts that Mr. Hinton was describing. They did great. Nobody contradicted the thing they said. Uh, we had the witnesses come in. Everybody was reinforcing his case. and it was difficult to go to a hearing like that and have everything go perfectly and then get a call saying that our motion for relief had been denied. And it felt like I was always calling Mr. Hinton and saying the court has denied relief and denied relief and denied relief. And I would go down there and sometimes we'd talk about it. It was so painful and heartbreaking. Uh, and yet it didn't take us long before we'd be talking and uh, he would say something to me that would make me laugh, and we'd be in the visitation room just laughing. And there was this dynamic that came out of all of this, uh, which was in so incredibly challenging, but at the same time inspiring. And so I just love being in public places like this, with the opportunities like the opportunity I have right now, um, to say to you, Mr. Hinton, how grateful I am, how privileged I am to have had the great fortune to have stood by your side and represent you along this journey. You have made my career and the work that I do so much more meaningful, and I believe that you've got even more to share with the world that can make us appreciate the demands of justice, the need for justice, but more than that, the importance of forgiveness and compassion. And so I want to thank you publicly in this space for taking the time to do what you do and sharing your heart so freely. Thank, thank you. you so much. So, so, so I want to begin by just asking a couple of questions about uh, reentry. So on the day um, that we walked out of that jail, uh, it was a kind of an overcast day, and people think that this is made up, but it's not. It was an overcast day, and we walked out, you walked out first, and your family was there, you saw some of that in the video, and it did seem like as soon as you walked out, the sun began to shine a little bit. And uh, we talked to the press and all of that, uh, but the world has changed a lot since uh, when you went to prison. And we did some interviews and things like that. And I know your great friend, uh, Lester Bailey, was there, there and he uh, picked you up. And, and I'd, I'd like you to just kind of talk about where you went immediately after uh, you came out the jail and what that experience was like, because there was, things were different. There was technology. Uh, <clears throat> on getting out of prison, Lester, my best friend, which I didn't mention, stayed by my side for 30 years. He came to see me every month, 278 miles one way. And he kept telling me, 
everything have changed. Everything has changed. And I said, okay, so I get out on Good Friday. I go to church on Easter Sunday. And I notice the ushers get up and they go back toward the back. And I'm watching them. I got $22 in my pocket. And I see them get these old time, I call them collection plate. And they come by and I go in my pocket and I reach and I give him $20. I'm thinking he gonna ask me how much I wanna give. He keep the whole 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't say nothing because I'm in God's house and I wanna say, hey, bring me some change. <laughs> uh, but I didn't. So he come back again and I give him my last $2. And after church, I tell my best friend, I said, you lied to me 56 years we've been knowing each other, and you tell me a lie. And he said, what's, what you talking about? I said, you told me everything had changed. I said, they still passing those old collection plate around. Everything have not changed. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we leave church and up the day that I got out, I asked him to take me to the place where they laid my mom because I didn't know where she was buried. And he said, okay, we get in this car, and I don't know that you remember, he got this nice Escalade. And just the two of us, and we get in there, and we going down the road, and all of a sudden, some white lady come on and say, in one-tenth of a mile, turn. <laughs> she said, in one-tenth of a mile, turn right, and I said, what the hell? <laughs> I said, where's that white lady at? And he just died laughing. I said, you didn't hear that white lady? And he just laughed and I said, listen, a white lady in his car. I know didn't nobody get in that car but me and my best friend. I wanted to know how did she get in that car? Better yet, what is she doing in this car? And he just laughed and he pointed at what I thought was the radio, I said, no, this wasn't the radio. He pointed, he said, that's a GPS tractor. He said, she would tell us everywhere we need to go, when to turn. And I found that to be amazing that modern technology had rigged up something down that you can just punch in and they'll tell you exactly. But the white lady scared me. <laughs> uh, you have to remember, I went to prison because of white people. And I'm uh, still kind of literal of white people. So, uh, I thought it was a trick, but um, that's... It, it, it's, been, it's been really um, amazing uh, to see each month go by. You know, when, when you first got out that day, and I, I'd gotten you a little iPhone, hmm. and we were playing with it. Uh, and, you know, uh, then you did some other things, and, and you got an email, and you've been making this progress what do you think is uh, you've been able to adjust to the most in the last 11 months? And what do you think you still haven't been able to adjust to very much? I've been able to adjust to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. When I left, most of the road was just two lane highways. Now you got this interstate, this technology, uh, the telephone. And I look out in the audience and uh, perhaps someone can tell me this text I don't understand why you text somebody when you can just call them and tell them uh, what you want. And my little niece, she always telling me, Uncle Ray, I can group text 15 people. And I said, why would you want 14 other people to know what you're talking about? <laughs> and I just, being old school, think that texting is kind of lazy. Just pick up dial and number and just tell whoever you want or what it is. But there's so much that I feel that I have been cheated of. I still yet do not know how to download, and I hear you can get some free music. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to download that. Uh, I can hear you can get some free movies. I don't know how to do that. Uh, 
but the phones and everything is so unique. And it just shows you that how great man mind is, mm -hmm. that you can put a phone in your pocket. And uh, I even learned how to, uh, my best friend, I gave him a uh, different call from anybody. Everybody else, uh, number ring, just regular ring. He has got a special tone to it. And, and no matter where I hear that ring, and I run to the phone because it's him. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to learn how in the world that this modern technology come from, when I used to be in the street, I used to see men climbing telegram poles. And now you call the other day, I was down in Montgomery and something was wrong with my phone and the lady said, all of your messages up in the cloud and I'm looking up in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what she mean by cloud, but the guy that was with me was trying to explain to me. And I know it kept saying megabytes, and I still don't know what a megabyte is. And I just don't ask people because I don't want to feel, I really don't want to feel dumb to some people. I don't want people to look at me and say, wow, for those that don't know me, where you been for the last 40 years, you know, and uh, I pretend like I know what they're talking about, and I'm saying when they leave, what the hell she just said. <laughs> so I just go that way. But modern technology is, is something that I don't believe that I will ever be able to catch up because when I got out, you had the privilege of handing me an I-5. Now they talking about an I-6. <laughs> and somebody told me, where well, they coming out with I-7? I said, they can come out with whatever they want. I ain't trying to come out with nothing else but this I-5. <laughs> and like I say, it's so much on them that I haven't learned. Uh, I got lost about three weeks ago and my best friend said, you got a map on your phone, all you got to do is tell it. I don't know how to go on there and tell that person where I want to go in. And people don't have time to just sit mm -hmm. and go over stuff with you, uh, everybody in a hurry. So I just try to leave at time. Uh, other day I had an appointment and I needed to be there at nine. I left at six so I make sure I get there and, uh, but if I had known how to work the modern technology, I could have left for a decent hour and got there. But uh, hopefully one day I can catch up a little bit better than what I am now. Well, I think you're doing remarkably well because you were sending me texts and yeah. emails and I was hard to figure out how to send them back. So I think you're doing great. What do you think it's been the hardest to kind of make the adjustments? I know you've talked about still not being able to get out of that routine, that rigorous, restrictive routine that they have people on on the row, uh, what do you think has been hardest? I think the hardest is, you know, when I got out of prison, the state of Alabama did not offer me any type of psychological help. Uh, I don't believe any of us is, was created to survive 30 years in a cage. Uh, I do believe that there is something mentally uh, wrong with me. I try my best to ignore it. I find myself thinking more of uh, being on death row than perhaps I should. Uh, but for instance, as I said, every morning I'm up at 3 a.m. and I get up and I cannot go back to sleep. Doctors, I went to my doctor and he gave me some medicine and I do believe that mind over matter is more strong. That medicine did not help me at all. Uh, 15 minutes to, th uh, to three every morning, I'm up and I sit up and most of the time I read and I ask myself, did I shower yesterday? Mm -hmm. And if I convinced myself, yeah, you showered yesterday, for when we was on death row, you just kind of like washed up in the sink. Mm -hmm. So those prison mentality is still on in my mind. And when it get dark, I begin to look for a correction officer to say, hey, it's time to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the privilege of opening my cabinets and eating whatever I want to eat. But believe it or not, when you get used to prison food, other food just don't taste the same. And so I'm trying to learn how to get my palate back. But one thing I can say is that I can cook uh, perhaps the best homemade red velvet cake 
than anyone. Oh, you can definitely do that. <laughs> I, I, I'm a witness to that, absolutely. But uh, people ask me every day, you know, how old do you try to survive? And I have to believe that uh, through God strengthening me. And I have to believe that there is something better. And I cannot afford to just relax and have an, anyone caught on every day, I make sure that I am surrounded by people. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got out, I was going to a restaurant and I would ask the waitress, would you mind signing your name? So if something came back up, mm -hmm. I could say I was there at this restaurant. Mm -hmm. And that waitress, uh, she signed her name because I went to prison as they said, because I couldn't give an account where I was uh, the night of the crime. So I still now come out and I live every day in more like a, a diary. Wherever I go, I make sure someone remember that I was with them at that particular time. And every night uh, I'm at home uh, by myself, uh, I get on the telephone because I'm told that uh, they can track exactly where you was with the phone. And so uh, if something come up, I can say, well, I was at home in my living room talking to whoever. And so uh, uh, I don't think, as I said, a year is going to erase 30 years. Uh, I've been deeply scarred, and I think it's going to take some time uh, before yeah. I can really feel secure about where I'm at and where I'm uh, around. I make sure that... Uh, I leave that house door every morning. Uh, life has taught me this trust factor is gone. I didn't know anyone in this origin. If I had met them, I would trust them. My mom told me a long time ago, trust people until they give you a reason not to trust them. And now I only trust two people. I trust you. And I trust my best friend, Lester. Uh, I know that might sound somewhat cold, but that's what 30 years have done to me. I still believe in treating people with respect, but when someone say they want to do something, when someone asks me, I just don't have that trust uh, that I once had. Yeah. And I would love for that to come back because that's who I am, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so I want to talk a little bit. Uh, we're going to open this up for questions in a bit, but I do want to talk about uh, Mr. Hinton's experience uh, in the context of this trauma, uh, because at that you can't go through what he went through and not be uh, challenged, uh, traumatized by that. And I want to put it in a broader historical context before we open things up, because in many ways. Uh, when I was a young lawyer, I thought all I had to do was go to court and I could represent people like Mr. Hinton, and the courts would say, he's been wrongly convicted, we're going to get him out. And uh, I've told him this, he knows this. We, I lost a lot of sleep on this because I couldn't understand with the evidence so overwhelmingly clear, why did people keep saying, deny, we're not going to let him go? It was so clear. There are cases of people who are innocent, who've been wrongly convicted, where the evidence is not clear. There's, you know, there's competing evidence. There's something that's a little tricky. And in those cases, you can reconcile while some people are saying, no, he's guilty, and while he's not. But there are other cases like where there was no evidence of guilt. We knew exactly where he was. When he was to and yet, the state persisted. They didn't have a single piece of evidence that would persuade them. We had discredited the ballistics. We had discredited the gun evidence kept saying thing in. And what occurred to me some years ago is that the reason why we're having such hard times is because there is this narrative that we haven't discussed in this country that allows people to not value the victimization of all people equally. Some people's victimization just doesn't get credited. And that victimization is a lot Michael, do you want me to use this one? Let me, I can do this. Let me stop here and open it up for questions for everyone. I want to thank everybody for being here. I, 
I think we'll just, let's, well, do we have time for the video? We, five minutes. Okay, so we'll show the video, then we'll take the questions. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant. But as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent, hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa, crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly, visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. Enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 Declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South, and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African Americans together in coffles and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day, turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. The domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. 
Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. Uh, before I take the first question, I just wanted to acknowledge that video was made possible by the incredible artwork of uh, a local artist and activist uh, named Molly Crabapple, and I urge you uh, to look for her work and to support it anytime you see it. So I want to thank her for helping us put that together. Yes, ma'am, first question. Um, I have a question and a statement. First question, are you part of the Kellogg Foundation's initiative? Yes. Yeah, yes, we are part of that initiative, and, and I'm, I'm proud to have their support. Uh, our work is a little different. We're, we're not, we don't think of this as sort of racial healing as much as we think of it as truth and reconciliation, that we've got to tell the truth about this. We can't make people reconcile themselves to that truth, but I think the truth-telling has to happen first, and hopefully people will be motivated to do well, that. Truth is the first word in the, the new initiative. So. Wonderful. And, yeah. and the thing I want to say, which is, I think will be controversial, is that my great-great-aunt was murdered in uh, central Ohio and there, in 1905. And there had been a lynching in cent central Ohio, Springfield, Ohio, the year before. That was extremely brutal. The lynchings in the north may not have, we don't, I, I don't know, are frequent as they were in the South, but they happened. They, the local mob gathered and they found a, a young black man that they were sure had done it and they were about to lynch him when the local sheriff got him out of town. They, he, he, it worked, he, they decided he wasn't guilty, but no one ever investigated further the murder of my great great aunt. And I want to propose that white women and the violence against white women was masked by the lynching of the black men accused and, and the focus on the impunity of the actual perpetrators of, of violence against white women um, used that as a, a method of, to maintain their impunity. In Ida B. Wells' uh, biography, she talks about white men raping white women wearing blackface. And I went very much for both women's rights and uh, black civil rights to understand their connection. Yeah. No, I think it's an important point. I mean, I do think that um, the status of women, white women in particular, is a central feature of the larger narrative, right? Because uh, there were lots of lynchings that took place in the South involving black men who were accused of intimacy with white women, which meant that if you had a note that a white woman had gave you, if you stood too close to a white woman, if you laughed at a person's show, we have cases where people were lynched because they went to the front door of a home when only a white woman was present. And so there was this perverted idea of protecting the identity and the status of white women, at the same time using it as a pretense for this violence. But it is a complex history because many of the people who were lynched were never accused of violent crimes. They were accused of doing things that just threatened that order. And the reason why we focus on that narrative and we call it terrorism is because it wasn't about crime. It wasn't about punishment. It was about sustaining racial hierarchy. 
It was about sustaining white supremacy. And there were violent acts committed against people who were white, and smart white people who wanted to commit a violent act would use blackness as a way to cover that. And, and, and that's a, that's a, it's a, a serious problem. It's a different problem than the problem of using lynching to sustain uh, racial hierarchy. And we do talk about lynchings all over the country, but in most parts of the country where you had that kind of violence that were not the Deep South, it was sort of frontier justice. And there's a difference between frontier justice where people are engaging in mob violence because there is no functioning criminal justice system and what we call terror lynchings. The, the lynchings that we document occupied, or took place in places where there was a functioning criminal justice system. There were jails, there were judges, there were lawyers, there were all of that, but that wasn't good enough for these accused people. Black people were being denied even the dignity of a trial, of being a defendant. And you're right, there is a connection to this. Mr. Hinton spent 30 years on death row for a crime he didn't commit. The state's not looking for the people who committed the crime. Somebody got away with murder. The yeah. murders did take place. But because we are preoccupied with this narrative that has these racial features, we not only don't do justice for the people who are being victimized by it, we don't do justice for anybody. And in that narrative, I think there is the opportunity to do more, to say more, and to get us closer to where we need to be. Yeah. Thank you. Please, yes. Hello, um, my name is Joy. Um, talking about voices and whose voice is being heard. As a white woman, I don't want to take up too much time yeah. speaking. Um, that's not why I'm here. But I am actually here to relay a message as part of why I'm here from a man on death row mm. in um, Alabama, Chanel Jackson mm. in Holman. I don't know if you know him. We both um, know him well. <laughs> oh, you know him too? Yes. I didn't know that. Okay, so he, um, his is a case that is a little less clear in terms of innocence, one of those murky cases that you were talking about. I, my mom, um, on her journey of learning about whiteness and privilege and, and prison abolition and everything, she's a wonderful activist, started pen palling with Chanel through one of those programs. She's Quaker, we're yeah. Quaker. So I've known Chanel since I was 13, 14, I'm 23 now, um, has really shaped my understanding of race and the prison system and death row and really has formed a big part of who I am today and he knows I'm here so I'm just saying hey from Chanel <laughs> it's a lot less hopeful for him unfortunately he's yeah. on his last state appeal I don't know if it's gone to Supreme Court no he's now in federal court yeah, yeah and yeah he's yeah. now in federal court it's not looking too hopeful he's been on the row for most of his life mm -hmm. um, black poor mm -hmm. Very similar situation. So I didn't even know, I didn't know you knew him too, yeah. but. Well, so yeah. well, actually, no, I appreciate that. Actually, the case is a case worth, worth, worth just mentioning. Uh, Chanel Jackson is on death row in Alabama. He got to death row despite the fact that at his trial, the jury rendered a 12 0 verdict for life. Mm -hmm. But we have elected judges, and our elected judges have the authority to override jury verdicts mm -hmm. of life, and that's how he got mm -hmm. his. Uh, death sentence, um, and there are dozens of people on death row mm -hmm. who were condemned through a process like that that is very, very politicized. And mm -hmm. so one thing I do want to just say to people, this program where people are corresponding to, we have a program, if any of you are interested in engaging directly uh, with people who are in jails and prisons, many of whom are wrongly convicted, I hope you'll go to our website, the material, the calendar has information there. Uh, we love connecting incarcerated people with people on the outside. And maybe Mr. Hinton can say a word about how important that can be. We've got lots of people in jails and prisons who never hear mm. uh, from folks on the outside. And maybe you can say something about why you think that might be important, uh, Ray. I think it's important that people from the outside give you uh, that little sense of hope. Uh, I was blessed with a friend that stuck by me for 30 years. Uh, when you're in a five by seven, and let me say this up front, I was born to a family of five sisters and four brothers. In the 30 years that I was on death row, I did not see my brothers or my sisters. And so by having a friend, I was able to continue to try to have that strength, to try to have that hope. And when you hear from someone that you don't know, it gives you a sense that someone do care. And we sit and we don't want to judge, but people just need to know that someone care about them and just a letter that every now and then saying hello how you doing uh it goes great uh, yeah. to that person yeah please oh, i'm so busy listening <laughs> <laughs> um one i'd like to say thank you mr hinton for sharing your story because it makes it real 
Um, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My name is Emma. And I had the privilege of serving on a jury in 2014, and I was actually the foreperson. And um, during jury selection, uh, one of the people who was actually chosen as a juror actually said, well, if he was arrested, he must be guilty of something. And that young man was an African American. And uh, luckily, um, you know, I have a lot of sales experience. <laughs> and that, uh, that conviction was not gonna happen. So we actually, I mean, it was real rough and tumble. We, he was the only holdout. So my question is, when you look at, uh, you know, you want the jury to be made up of the person's peers, but you know, we live in a society where you know, we've all gone through some level of brainwashing and you kind of have to wash your brain to kind of come to some place where you're thinking logically. What can, what can we do as a public? What can, you know, I mean, if I weren't on that jury, probably it would have been hung. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just knowing, mm -hmm. you know, what I saw in that room. And it was basically the person's peer who was actually pro probably going to, you know, have it be hung and have it go to another jury. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to be more conscious, to get more people who are conscious to, you know, be on juries? You know, what's, what's the kind of solution there? Yeah. Well, I'll start. Uh, I mean, I think, first of all, it's important that people show up. I mean, the biggest problem that we have, to be honest, huge uh, disparities in the, in the percentage of people of color who are called to jury service and the people who show up. There are a lot of reasons for that that we've got to address. So we need to change the system so that uh, young mothers can have daycare and support, that people who are employed won't lose their jobs if they're called for jury service. The juries have been taken over by largely older, retired white people mm -hmm. in a lot of jurisdictions because they have both a desire and the capacity to serve in that role. So it's important to show up. And then when you show up, it's important to imagine that the person who's on trial is somebody who is in your family that you care about. Because we see a lot of people desperately trying to get off of uh, jury service trying to get out of jury service, and that then leaves people vulnerable to the kind of misjudgments and convictions that we see too often. So it's basically about taking this responsibility seriously. In the Deep South, we tell people of color, mm -hmm. people fought and died for your right to serve on a jury. How dare you not uh, show up? How dare you not accept that obligation, that responsibility, because it's inconvenient, because it's a little challenging? I think that's the big part of it. And then the second part of it is to, is to demand, you know, just take, take it seriously. I think black and brown people in this country are presumed dangerous and guilty. There's a presumption of guilt that they walk in, like that young man said. There's a presumption of guilt. And your charge is a presumption of innocence. And when you're in that role, it's important that you keep underlining that idea. If, if the state cannot prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, we are supposed to acquit. And it doesn't matter whether we think he did it or not, we've got to make our judgment rooted in that presumption. And I think that's absolutely key. Yeah. Hi, thank you both so much for being here. And um, this has been an amazing lecture. But I just wanted to ask, you were talking about changing the narrative of this country around it. And I think something that I'm very interested in is I have a lot of good-hearted coworkers and friends and family who really honestly want to do good in the world, but they if I started talking about um, police brutality, their, their reality won't allow them to mm -hmm. see that, um, what actually happens in a lot of black and brown communities. So I, I think my question is, how do you start that conversation to, with people who, like it, this room is fantastic, but everyone here obviously had some sort of inclination to come. Like mm -hmm. how do we start this conversation with people who don't have the inclination to come to these events, um, who honestly are probably very good people, but don't have, um, the background and the, and the vision to see the reality of what this country was founded on. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, I've always said that people are so conscious of race. You start that conversation by being honest. You start it, and you might offend someone. But you know, truth do offend people. But you have to stick to your gun. You have to stick to what you believe in. As far as uh, how you get people to 
just invite them to a conversation. Uh, we need to talk more about the justice system in this country. We need to talk more about racism in this country. A young lady asked me about three weeks ago after I had told my story. She asked me, did I believe, did she, do I believe that racism had, is better now or was it better than it was when I went to prison? I think racism is worse now than it was 20, 30 years ago. And I think it's worse because it's more undercover. I often tell people, if you're going to ask me something, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I have to give, if you're going to give credit, I have to give the Klan's credit in the South. They took off the white robe and put on the black robe. We as a country, we must learn to start voting, not on racist line, but do your homework. I went through 15 uh, white judges, not a black judge, nowhere. And I began to look at the truth. We are allowing the Klansmen to do more now than they ever have before. We don't get out, and I'm gonna have to say it, black people don't get out to vote. We don't, we afraid when, as Mr. Stevens said, uh, jury duty in Alabama, uh, the prosecution more than likely will strike every black person that's on his uh, roster. But guess what they do? They go home and they lay down, well, I got struck. You should protest. And I would love to challenge young people. This country was not given to you. People died, people lost their lives, so you can enjoy whatever you enjoy now. You need to get up and fight for something because I'm afraid what happened to me can happen to someone else. And the only way we won't stop it from happening is that we got to start marching, and I'm not talking marching and looting, I'm talking about marching and demand that the right people start doing what you send them uh, to Congress, what you send senators to do. Uh, we got to start getting up and making a voice and we making people understand we ain't going to take this and tolerate it any longer. Hello. Thank you for being here to speak. Um, and thank you for talking about the specific action steps that we can take next. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about going back to law school. Um, but is there anything else that we can do? Do you need volunteers for EJI? Yeah. What needs to happen um, for everyday citizens? How can we yeah. aid your work? Yeah, well, I really appreciate that question. Um, yes, I mean, I think we, we, we do have a program where we're looking for people who are willing to correspond with incarcerated people. You know, the calendars that we're handing out, I hope that people do take them and put them up in their workplaces. I mean, one response to that question is that if you, we've had people uh, facilitate conversations just with these images, right? The images are challenging, but they will actually prompt the kind of discourse that sometimes allows you to get underneath the things that people are used to talking about. You know, videos like the video that we showed to you are available. We want you to take it. We want you to share it with people. We've got some other materials on our website that we, we hope you'll pick up and use to facilitate. We are calling people to join us on the soil collections that we're doing where we're going to lynching sites. We're calling people to join us and the construction of the memorial and the construction of the museum. Uh, Reentry is a word that didn't exist 20 years ago, but it's going to be a word that defines the next generation, because every day there are going to be, hopefully, thousands of people coming out of jails and prisons. And like Mr. Hinton, if we're not there to support him, if somebody's not there to help them recover, we're making it very easy for them to fail. We're making it very hard for them to succeed. It's hard to succeed even when you have people who are trying to help you, but it's impossible to succeed without that. And so everyone has skills, ability, and capacity to help people recover from incarceration. It doesn't matter whether they were there wrongly or not, for, for crime they committed or didn't, innocent or not, they still need that help rec recovering. And there's some wonderful organizations here in the city, in Brooklyn, that are looking for volunteers to do reentry work and support. I urge people to take that up, because there's probably no more pressing need than helping people recover uh, from years and decades of imprisonment uh, without support and, 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 and service. Uh, that'd be my call to action. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, Mr. Um, Hinton, 
Firstly, I have four questions, very short questions. The first is, what have you done, what are your plans for employment and professional, your own professional development? Second question, what three specific reforms would you recommend in prison to change the prison environment? The third question, Mr. Stevenson, what specific activities can we as a society, and I'm talking about the financial community, mm -hmm. businesses, mm -hmm. what can they do in the reentry to solve the reentry problem? And the fourth and probably most important question for you, Mr. Hinton, is what will the Mets do this season? And will they be better than the Yankees? <laughs> what will the who do? Mets, the New the York Mets, Mets. The Mets, the Mets, okay. <laughs> Well, you can answer me, that question first, Mr. Let me ask you uh, about the Mets. <laughs> you a Mets fan? I am. I was originally a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and I converted to the Mets, yes. Well, I feel bad for you. <laughs> uh, no team will ever steal my heart like the beloved Yankees. Y'all went last year and you embarrassed New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think that New York is one of the greatest places that you can play baseball. Uh, the Mets, they need to fold up shop. <laughs> and some of your good players should come over to New York Yankees side <laughs> and perhaps we can go back to winning championship like we used to do. Uh, but if, if New York waiting on the Mets to win a championship, they're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> so. uh, do, do you want to... <laughs> what about uh, the other three questions? <laughs> <laughs> so the first question was... Was what are Mr. Hinton's plans for uh, employment yeah. and professional development? Well, Your you own know, plan. My, my, my plan is to go around the country and try to make some changes. You know, I could have easily come out and live with my best friend for a year. I could have either got him to try to take care of me for another year. But I believe that we as people, when we see something wrong in it, it has to start with us. What would I feel like, what would I be like to get off death row and do nothing? All I can do is go around the country and tell people my story. I hope that it will inspire people because I believe what happened to me as I was telling Mr. Stevenson coming over here. If you think that there haven't been some innocent people that executed in this country, you sadly mistaken. I believe that we don't need a death penalty in this country. As long as, <laughs> long as you have prosecutors that are political driven, long as you have uh, people that are racist, long as you have judges that is care more about getting reelected than doing what is right under the law, then we need to strike down uh, that law. And just like you don't have the death penalty here in New York, I'm trying my best to go around the country and, and get the law uh, abolished, not just in the South, but everywhere. We just don't need it. Because as long as uh, we as humans, we make mistakes, I wish I could tell the audience that they'd made a mistake on me, but they didn't. Regardless, I spent 30 years of my life for something I didn't do. I don't want to see that happen to no one else. And I'm going to get up every morning, and I'm going to make sure someone hear me. And hopefully, if I keep talking, maybe the right person will, will hear me and help me try to change it. Okay, and what changes would you make in the prison, inside? What, what should they do that they're not doing now? We're actually out of time. I'm getting a lot of signals here, so I'm sorry. But, uh, uh, 
Uh, okay, well, we, when we get, since we had one. Well, yes, why don't we do those really, really quickly, because we are past time. Uh, firstly, Mr. Hinn, go Yankees. Okay. <laughs> go Yankees. And um, I want to just thank you for your tears, because you're modeling healing. So I want to thank you for that. I, um, thank you. Um, I feel very blessed that um, I work as an advocate and get to talk about trauma, race, and justice every day. But on the side, I work with young children and, and teenagers and talk about race and um, bias. And um, I've been doing that for over 10 years. And I was really worried after Obama was elected and there was a narrative of a post-racial America. And I would hold these workshops with children and there was a lack of, of a, a grabbing hold of this conversation. That has radically changed in the last few years. They can't get enough. They are so hungry for this narrative shifting. And what disturbs me, what's, what's scary is that teachers are, so now I have teachers who stand in the back of the class listening because they're concerned and they want to, they're, they're, they're nervous that opening up this conversation about slavery really creates something. I wanted to ask you how you're engaging with young people mm -hmm. um, and what do we do about those, especially teachers, administrators, who are reluctant and, and fearful of the thing that you're really raising that we need. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are very much mindful of the need to kind of engage kids of all ages. Some of the tools that we're using are really designed for young kids. Um, Mr. Hinton has been giving talks uh, at EGI and sometimes we're with adult groups and sometimes we're with middle-aged student groups and the young kids I think respond as intensely mm -hmm. and as with much uh, you know reactivity as, as the older groups and I think that that uh, we have to teach young people this history to make them sensitive and aware of the challenges that we face but a lot of the tools that we're developing we hope are, will be employed uh, with very young kids and for very young people. Our, my young clients, I'm certainly trying to get them to appreciate, if they understand this history, there's a story of survival that will empower them to deal with some of the challenges that we're dealing with today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more question? <clears throat> yeah, my, my. I'm so, go ahead, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, super quick, just, my name's Jeffrey Deskovic. I'm, I'm an exoneree also. I spent 16 years in prison prior to being proved, proven innocent through DNA uh, 10 years ago. Um, I'm also an advocate. So in the last, my question's this. In the last year and a half, the mood of the country has changed uh, in terms of criminal justice reform. Uh, I've, and although mass incarceration, unjustifiable deadly police force, police brutality have taken center stage in that conversation and to a lesser extent uh, prison reform and inmate education. My question is how do we break through to add wrongful conviction to that? I mean I've gone back and forth to DC, I've met with White House staff, elected officials, I've, I've continued to do a lot of public speaking and, and media interviews and I can't seem to get that issue framed in the same conversation as that. So my question is, from your vantage point and the work that you're doing, how do we add wrongful conviction so that it's ma mentioned in that same mm -hmm. conversation as those other worthy topics are? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, we're, I think we're close. I think what you are doing and what Mr. Hinton is doing is the essential answer. I think when people hear you and they know of your experiences, they're no longer, to have these, no longer willing to have these conversations without that being added to the list. I, I mean, I do think, we have this population of innocent people wrongly convicted and unfortunately uh, we've all just accepted that there are innocent people in jails and prisons. We accept that innocent people have been sentenced to death. You know, we've now had nine, uh, you know, and Mr. Hinton was the 152nd person exonerated after being on death row. We're now up to 156, which means that for every nine people we've executed, we've identified one innocent person on death row who's been exonerated. That ought to be an error rate that causes everybody to say, let's stop the death penalty. We can't have a death penalty if we have an error rate that high. For every nine planes that took off, one crash, everybody would stop flying, right? Mm -hmm. And we haven't created that consciousness. So I think what we have to do is what you're doing, is to give voice in a very personal way to the trauma, the ugliness, the pain that these kinds of convictions take place. And then the second thing is we've got to create an infrastructure where people are held accountable 
when they are responsible for wrongful convictions. You can't sue prosecutors. If, if, if there was liability when a prosecutor convicted someone who was innocent, if there was liability when the police contributed to that conviction, if, there were, if people were held criminally liable, if they were held civilly liable, we could change this in a very quick, quick amount of time. But right now, you can put somebody in prison forever and never have to do anything about it. That accountability piece, that, impu that getting past that impunity, I think is going to really be key to how we turn this around. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I think that nobody will leave here today the same as when they walked in. And that is a good thing. Thank you for joining us. Please join me on Sunday, this, uh, March 20th. My friend and sister, Sophia Elijah, who's the executive director of the Correctional Association, will be leading a panel, The Role of Culture and Social Change. Kathleen Cleaver, Secretary of the Black, former Secretary of the, for the Black Panther Party, will be on the on the panel, and Monica Dennis of the uh, New York's Black Lives Matter and other people as well. And do join us for the Sackler Center First Awards on June 2nd. We will be honoring Angela Davis, feminist scholar, activist for social justice. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.